Hello, everyone. Good morning. On behalf of my colleagues, I want to welcome you to this month's talk from the Johns Hopkins Institute of Assured Economy Seminar Series, co-sponsored by the Computer Science Department of the Whiting School of Engineering. Each month, we'll have a talk on the research topics at the intersection of assurance and autonomy. The seminar will be recorded. Today's speaker is Missy Cummings. Professor Cummings is a professor in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at Duke University. She received her BS in mathematics from the US Naval Academy in 1988, her MS in space systems engineering from the Naval Postgraduate School in 1994, and a PhD in systems engineering from the University of Virginia in 2004. A Naval officer and military pilot from 1988 to 1999, she was one of the US Navy's first female fighter pilots. She is currently the director of the Humans and Autonomy Laboratory at Duke. She is an American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics Fellow and a member of the Defense Innovation Board. Her research, include, research interests include human supervisory control, explainable artificial intelligence, human autonomous systems collaboration, human robotic interaction, human systems engineering, and the ethical and social impact of technology. Today, Dr. Cummings will talk about assessing human autonomy interaction in driving assist settings. Welcome, Missy, and over to you. Thank you. Um, hopefully everybody can see me and hear me. Thanks for the invitation. I really appreciate it. I have a long, uh, history with APL. Uh, APL paid for, or at least partially paid for my uh, PhD. So appreciate it. It was in the Tomahawk division. So uh, I feel like I've been in the APL family a long time. So uh, I am going to uh, give you now, see, hopefully the share screen will work. It looks like it's all the technology is coming into place. So the work I'm going to tell you about uh, was finished on, um, we actually finished this testing right as COVID hit. So we, we saw it coming in, we were literally racing um, to finish this in time because I knew what was about to happen with the lockdown. So this research is funded by the US Department of Transportation through a University Transportation Center grant. So I'm co-PI of a larger grant with the uh, University of North Carolina, the Center for Safety, uh, Collaborative Center Race Research Systems, CSCRS is what it is, um, through the Humans, uh, I'm sorry, the Highway Safety Research Center at UNC. So this work is part of a larger effort that we're looking at in terms of thinking about how to certify autonomous systems. So let me just start with, uh, even though we're looking at cars, specifically Teslas today, the lessons learned from this are going to broadly apply to all autonomous systems um, in safety critical environments where humans are expected to take control at some place or time. All right, so when we're looking at cars, uh, specifically what we call L2 plus cars. And many of you who are not following the SAE levels of autonomy or automation, whatever you wanna call them, the SAE and in general, the driving surface transportation world feels like that there's roughly five levels of automation. Uh, five would be driver who can sleep in the back while the car does everything. Zero is human does everything. L2, uh, level two is considered the, the car can do some axes of control, but the human is expected to pay attention at all times, regardless of how much control and what the environment is of control. Now uh, we could say uh, emergency braking fits inside L2 systems, fantastic technology. I think we should make it mandatory on every car. So there's some really good L2 technologies out there. L2 plus is less clear. L2 plus technologies can do multiple axes of control at the same time. There are really only two cars 
broadly available on the market today that fall into the L2 plus category. That would be Tesla because of their autopilot and then Cadillac with Super Cruise, although GM just announced that I think on the Volt, um, they're gonna have Super Cruise. So it's gonna become more and more plentiful, but this idea of having cars be able to do most of the control where humans are just babysitting. Well, for those of you who are in human factors or human systems engineering, you're just like, oh, what could go wrong? I mean, the answer is what's not gonna go wrong when you have humans babysitting um, automation. We learned a lot about this in aviation over the last 30 years, but it's kind of new in the driving domain. So uh, I wanna introduce, um, to help you better understand this, I wanna under quickly introduce this SRKE framework, which I can give you more information. Of course, as a good academic, I've got all kinds of papers on this that I can bury you in later. But the idea is that any kind of agent, whether it's an automated autonomous agent or a human has to go through five levels of, re or, I'm sorry, four levels of reasoning before they can effectively and effectually control a system. So the first one is skill-based reasoning. This is where you learn to stay between the white lines on the road. When you first do it, it's not necessarily intuitive, but it's very easy perceptually for you to pick up and the human brain centers very well. And so within a very short period of time, humans can um, very quickly learn to stay between the two white lines on the road. Once you free up your cognitive resources to make sure that you're safely going down the road, then you can start to understand rules. When should you come to a stop, for example? Uh, and then as you go higher up in this framework, you get to something we call knowledge-based reasoning. This is where you have to apply judgment under uncertainty. And this is where you see the uncertainty arrow growing. So the world is not exactly clear so in the case I'm showing here, this is a stop sign partially obscured by um, branches. So every human of normal vision who sees only half the stop sign understands instantly that it is still a stop sign and that the rules still apply. But it turns out for autonomous systems, specifically because of flaws and perception systems, uh, this becomes difficult. So while cars can keep themselves between the white lines, probably better than humans can at this stage, and if a car can see a stop sign, it can execute the rules. Um, an automated car can see the stop sign. It can execute the rules very well. It all hinges upon seeing that stop sign. And it turns out because of some flaws in um, machine learning, and I'm not gonna get in, into that today, but you can go read some papers that I've written about this. In fact, I've got a whole paper just on this picture. Uh, you know, cars will not see this stop sign or not guaranteed to see this stop sign. And so that's bad. But then there's one higher level of reasoning and that's expert-based reasoning. And that's when you have to reason under maximal uncertainty to figure out what to do. And in this particular case, somewhere in America, there's this stop sign with, you, you can't move, right? If somehow you got to the stop sign, there is no way for you to go. So how do you, what do you do? Cars, autonomous cars would be frozen in, in this position because they're programmed to not violate any rules, but there's no way for you to not violate this rule. So you're gonna have to do something, right? So this is where we see that humans do well applying top-down reasoning. They have to figure out, make some guesses, make some estimates in a world that may not be uh, perfectly observable. Uh, whereas bottom-up reasoning is where we see all the information in the world and then make the correct associations necessary. Humans do both top-down and bottom-up reasoning. Uh, cars, autonomous cars today, self-driving cars, and L2 plus cars can really only do bottom-up reasoning. And we'll talk, we'll show some illustrations of that. And that just begs the question is, if these cars can only do bottom-up reasoning, we're necessarily uh, just breaking this system in half, right? So this is, this is what's happening. Cars can only do the bottom half. Human, and they're asking humans to jump in to do the top half. And it's not clear how to do that because we know humans are bad babysitters of automation and how to make sure that the car hands over control at the right time, at the right place, ensuring that the human is paying attention is very, very tricky. Okay, so as part of this effort to start thinking about certification of autonomous systems, we needed to get some data. We really didn't have any sense uh, as to 
how much variability is within a single autonomous system or across multiple autonomous systems? And indeed, while there has been a lot of testing of Teslas in various capacities by IHS, the Institute uh, for Highway Safety, uh, and some other consumer re reports, for example, AAA, they haven't really done either laboratory controlled tests where that, that it's really a controlled setting and using multiple cars of the same make and model, right? So you have to get you know, the correct sample size to be able to make any inferences about statistics. So we decided to do four tests and this blue graph here represents our hypotheses for the test. So they're called curve construction lane departure highway. I'm gonna go into detail about these. And we expected that um, on the axes of complexity that the curve test would be the hardest and that the highway test would be the easiest. And then in terms of execution, how well did we expect the car to perform? Well, since cars, um, Tesla's supposedly contract between white lines very well on a highway, for example, we expected highway performance to be the best and curve and construction test to be the worst. Now, when you think about these systems, you know, thinking about the complexity of the environment and the execution capabilities of the car is important, but they necessarily must be taken into account in light of driver alerting. So in all cases for all L2 plus cars, humans can take their hands off the wheel for short periods of time. Maybe, maybe they might be able to glance away, but they've got to be able to re-engage in seconds, right? Because bad things can happen in seconds on highways. And so we wanted to find out how consistent the driver alerting was, meaning did the human get alerted at the right place in the right time period to affect safe control? And the assumption is for all of our tests were that the driver's distraction. So we had our Confederate driver act like he was distracted. He was anything but distracted. And we had another person in the car with him to make sure that, uh, you know, I can't go around killing grad students. Uh, so we had to make sure it was very safe. But he, what you're going to find out is he was acting as if he was completely distracted. And we wanted to see how the car would perform, not only in terms of its execution, but its driver alerting. So I'm lucky enough to be part of a consortium in North Carolina, and I have access to this North Carolina Center for Automotive Research track. I'll show you a picture in a second. These guys are great. It's a NASCAR track. It's amazing the fun things that you can go do on this track. And they were, um, so they're a partner of ours and we've done all of our testing, save for the highway testing um, on the track. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. We tested three 2018 Tesla Model 3s. We wanted to test Cadillacs as part of this test. We could not because Cadillac does not let you run Super Cruise off of approved highways and they were not gonna let us do it on this test track. So in the future, we are gonna um, look at developing tests that we do on just approved roads for Cadillacs because we'd like to see how it compares. Each of the tests got 10 randomized runs for each of the cars. So each of the tests total N, the sample size for each test is 30. Um, there was a problem with the software versions of the cars. Despite the fact that we had three Model 3s, all the same year make a model, they all had different software versions. And we'll talk a little bit more about why that was and why it could be a problem and why it, um, we're gonna have some surprising results about that. Uh, we made the cars as alike as we could, despite the fact that we could not control the um, underlying software. And we did all the tests in a six hour window between 11 a.m. and 5 p.m. in March of last year. So one of the certification issues for agencies are they don't have access to all the underlying information about what's happening in the car. You can go through the OBD, you can get some information maybe about basic speed and braking, but proprietary issues being what they are, you can't get access to autopilot information on Tesla without working directly with Tesla. Um, I, despite the fact that I love Tesla the car, I've been very vocal about how bad autopilot is. So there was no way in heck that Tesla was going to allow me to have access to their autopilot data. So we had to figure out a way to get all the data that we needed to make sure that we could 
say something with scientific certainty about what's happening. So we positioned three cameras in the car to make sure that we had views going um, and they, they were all synced together. So you could see the road, you could, we looked at the drivers because where the driver's hands are, are going to be very important, uh, particularly for Tesla and you'll see why in a second. And we also over here, you want, we also wanted to see what is going on. This is the only information given to the driver in the Tesla Model 3. There is no conventional dashboard like maybe most of you are looking at. It all comes through the screen. Uh, there's some issues about that that um, are recently coming up in the news. So that this may, uh, they're gonna find out that may not be the best idea. But in this way, we could have total control over the information in the car without having to rely on proprietary information from Tesla. All right, so the first test, loss of lane marking. So this is what we call the curve test. So we wanted to put the cars in a challenging road environment. It's very curvy. And we know that the autopilot system, it guides quite a bit. The camera underlying camera vision system guides on the lane markings on the road. Now, Tesla says it will still guide on the road edges if it loses lane markings, but it wasn't clear to us what was gonna happen if there was a loss of lane marking in a challenging road environment and and the driver, the car starts to alert the driver and the driver never takes over. What happens? Tesla will say that um, there's a three strikes in your out policy, uh, meaning if you don't take over, it's gonna warn you three times, it will, it will take over and stop the car. So that was one of the things we wanted to test. So as you're seeing here in this rubric, the SRKE framework that I told you about, we're really looking here, what's the skill of the car? How well can it negotiate this? How well does it engage the driver, um, especially when we break it at this point um, in the halfway point? And then what is the between and within car variability? So this was the portion of the track that we used. This isn't the whole track. This is just the one section of the track that we used. So what you see here is that the car is, um, starts here, it accelerates. It's put into autopilot once we get to lane markings on the road, it drives for this um, distance and then the lane markings end and then it's a 120 degree turn and then a 190 degree turn uh, and then we'll see what the car does. Uh, these are the three warnings that we expected the car to go to. The first warning, if the driver's hands are not on the wheel, they get an alert to apply slight turning force to the steering wheel. And this should happen as soon as the lane marking, uh, loss of lane marking. So when the car loses its lane marking it, and the driver's hands are not on the wheel and they um, detect it through torque monitoring, the car should alert the driver right, right away. If the driver doesn't take over in 10 seconds after this first alert, then the car is going to alert the driver a second time. Now, I think I want you to notice that this alert is really tiny. It's text-based to tell you that you should take over. You know, I, first of all, I think this is terrible UI, user interface design. But hey, what do I know? I I uh, am not the richest man on the planet. So then the second alarm just then puts it in blue. No, really, you should take over. So that's the only change for the second alert. And then the third strike you're out is all right. Autopilot is turning off. And if you don't really take over within five seconds, then I'm going to stop this car. Pull over, stop this car. Okay, let me tell you, 35 miles an hour doesn't sound like a lot. I rode through several of these tests with my students. This is, it's kind of nerve wracking to let a car, you're, nobody's steering, the human is not doing anything to have the car steer itself through this track. Don't try this at home, kids. Um, oops, uh, sorry. All right, so now let's look at the results. So the first thing I want to point out is, remember that my student was pretending that he was distracted and never touched the wheel, never touched the wheel. Autopilot safely stopped the cars in all 30 trials. The student never had to take over once, which was good. I was happy that everyone was safe. Unfortunately, there was extremely high variability for when that first takeover alert happened, meaning, so remember right here, this is when the last lane marking happened. The first alert to get your hands back on the wheel should have happened right here in zone one. Unfortunately, out of the 30 trials, only five of the trials happened in the place that it should have happened. And only one car, uh, that's the yellow, what you're seeing is car two is in the yellow. 
the next big chunk happened um, in zone two and the last big chunk, remember the last time of the, of the first alerts happened here. So basically uh, the zone three alerts happened about a quarter of a mile um, after the loss of lane markings. And remember the, we are assuming the driver is not paying attention at all. So clearly three clusters, and statistically these were, these were three clusters, no surprise there. And indeed, this is where you'll see um, how, the, how they turn out in terms of the individual cars. Uh, so this is bad because this is about a third of the, of the trials. This was, not only was it a quarter of a mile, it's almost 30 seconds beyond where the loss of lane marking event occurred. So that means that if a driver had not been paying attention and had their hands off the wheel, it would have been 30 seconds before they got the first alert. And this is bad because there have been deaths. There was a death in Mountain View, California um, under very, very similar circumstances where there was a loss of lane marking and uh, the driver was playing a video game and he died. He paid the ultimate price. And so, we, we, we know that the, the worst outcome can happen. What was surprising to us is how often it happened. So again, 30% of trials happen 30 seconds, almost 30 seconds beyond. Now, what about the intervals? Well, the good news is, is that the intervals that Tesla advertises, the 10 and five second between the first and second and second and third alerts, they're legit, right? They are, they're nailing the 10 second interval. They're nailing the five second interval. So this suggests to us that there's some huge problem in the perception system. There's a lot of variability in whether or not the car perceives that it has lost the lane marking. Once it perceives that it's lost the lane marking, it nails the alerting logic, but there's huge variability over when it loses and that it knows it loses the lane marking. So we did some investigation. We said, well, was there, you know, what, what are environmental conditions that could have affected it? You saw the track. There's a lot of turning that's happening and sun angle could, could potentially influence this. There is a problem. Teslas have a problem in long um, in late afternoon with long shadows. So long shadows on the white lines or on the road edges can cause uh, autopilot to fail. I've personally driven it. I've seen it um, happen, and it's widely reported. And even the NTSB has picked up on this. So we wanted to look at sun angle and just overall the brightness of the day. Every day we tested was the same. Big beautiful blue North Carolina sky with some puffy clouds. So there was no environmental difference between the cars. So uh, we did find out that there was some statistical difference between zone one and the other zones, or it was marginal, but close enough. Meaning it is likely that the cars in zone one may, for car two who had the five alerts in zone one, the sun angle may have helped the car uh, detect it, whereas the other cars didn't. Um, uh, so, I'm sorry, that was Luma. Uh, oh, yeah, and Sun Angle was a little bit lesser. It was P equals 0.08. We looked again at a logistic regression uh, model to see if we could see any difference between zone one and zone two. Maybe a little bit of a difference um, for Luma, but the Sun Angle was not. So, all of this suggests to us the bottom line is. As Luma, the brightness of the environment increases by one unit, there's a potential 12% increase in the likelihood that the car would experience a zone one alert. So that's important because while there has been, you know, this isn't gonna shut the door on this problem, it does suggest that the brightness of the day can actually impact how well the sensors detect the environment. All right, quick summary. The car did well, at least in basic safety. So we give it a green at the skill based. But, uh, you know, it's terrible. It's terrible. If 30% of trials are going a quarter of a mile before we actually alert the driver, we think that that's bad. One of the problems is we can't tell if it's a design flaw or was it a problem uh, with the communication between the perception and the autopilot. So, you know, and, and Tesla's not going to be talking about this. All right, test two, the construction zone. So cars um, of, with any kind of 
artificial intelligence, machine learning based algorithms, vision system going into a construction zone. This is a known bad situation. I worked with, when I was at MIT for 10 years, I worked with the Urban Grand Challenge team. So I saw this firsthand. I've done a lot of test driving. I sit on the board of directors for a Fortune 500 company. Um, so I've had a lot of experience looking at these systems in construction zones. And the reason that they're bad in construction zones are because construction zones carry a lot of variability and uncertainty. And it's difficult to train the machine learning models to recognize construction zones the same way every time. So again, we wanted to look at between and within car variability, but we also wanted to look at as the uncertainty increases in the environment, um, how well. So in the last case, you know, there wasn't uh, a lot of uncertainty in the environment other than the ability to track sharp corners. In this one, we've got potentially unexpected um, environments in the way of construction cones. All right, so same three Teslas. Now, this is where I need to tell you that car two, despite the fact that it was the same make and model, it, it had the full self-driving package, which is to say it should have performed the best. And arguably in the curve test, that it was the only car that at least gave 50% of its alerts in the place that it, they should have happened. But car two, part of the full self-driving package is, is that it allows you to visualize construction cones. So why all cars don't have this of the same make and model, that's part of the problem with these different software packages. But what we did is just to make sure that it was fair, we disabled the visualization uh, because we could on car two, but that was, we couldn't disable its detection. So indeed we would have anticipated that car two should have detected the construction zones because it had the ability to display them. So each of the cars, 10 miles each. This one, this test was conducted at 25 miles per hour because I know that Teslas have reported some problems in construction zones and I wanted to make sure my student had plenty of time to respond. So what you see here is the car starts, it comes around, it's put in autopilot, um, it tracks the lines. Here are the seven construction cones. We actually painted a yellow line here for the car to guide on. Most places in the country would not have this. Most countries the, um, will just set up a construction zone and not paint a guiding line. For reasons that we could talk about in a whole different um, conversation, the state of North Carolina loves to paint lines on roads for um, autonomous vehicles. So it is reasonable in North Carolina to expect that um, and it was a chalk line, it's very easy to lay a chalk line. We feel like that, you know, given how much we design our roads for autonomous vehicles, North Carolina would do it. Um, I doubt that this would happen in other states and indeed this is an area of future tests, but this is at least giving, it's, it's, a, it's kind of a crib sheet. It's a way that the um, autonomy can cheat because there is a line to guide on. All right, so let's see what happened there. All right, so <laughs> in, in the craziest of crazies, cars one and three uh, safely guided away from the collision, from the construction zone in all of their 10 trials. Car two, if my student hadn't taken over, it would have crashed in all 10 cases. I would like to remind you that car two is the one with full self-driving capability. We didn't turn that off. We just turned off the visualization so that my student wouldn't respond differently. And uh, so it was not good. Car two was definitely a failure in this case. Now, what about the alerting? And so the picture on the right and the picture at the bottom that you can see is that even the cars that did guide correctly, so remember cars one and three guided correctly in all 10 trials each, they didn't actually alert the driver because remember the, my student Ben was acting as if he was fully distracted, no hands on the wheel. So uh, car one only did 60% of the alerts and car two, uh, car three did 70% of the alerts, but still, right? So there were still lots of variability in terms of when the car is telling the driver that it's in an area it should not be in and the driver needs to take control. In car two, what was interesting is 
even though it would have killed the driver in all 10 of its trials, it at least warned the driver in three of its 10 trials that the driver was about to die. So it's interesting because what that means is the car did see something and at least 30% of the trials of the full self-driving car, car two did see those cones, but yet rejected them and did not guide away from them. So I would have expected car two to not see them at all, given the fact that all 10 times it would have driven into the cones. But there is a huge problem here because if the car is seeing it and alerting the driver, which we can at least see in 30% of the trials, it's not doing anything to save the driver. That's not good. Okay, little summary here. All right, so the cars, we had kind of a mixed bag here at the skill. You know, cars one and three were really good about uh, guiding away from the cones, but car two was awful. You know, again, there's kind of a the break here about driver handover, kind of good, pretty bad. Uh, you know, this would be 46% of the trials overall had no handover alert. If you take car two with that crazy full self-driving package, still 35% did not receive an alert. And um, we did do that. We just finished the brightness um, and we didn't see any brightness association, which is not um, surprising because this was all basically in a single plane um, the, as opposed to the um, curve test, which we saw lots of different um, angle changes of the heading of the car. So, you know, you have to ask yourself, is it, is this good if we know that if we're allowing people to take their hands off the wheel for up to 30 seconds, yet we're having people drive into these scenarios. And at least a third of the time, at best estimate, the car is not alerting the driver. You know, is this the kind of car that we really want to give the general public? All right, test three, the emergency road departure test. So Tesla claims that regardless of what mode you're in, even if you're not an autopilot, if you start to drift off the edge of the road, it will steer you back on the road and keep you safe. And this is, Tesla makes a lot of huge, huge claims about how safe the car is, that you're safer on, on autopilot um, as opposed to not having autopilot. But even if you're not on autopilot, the car is gonna save your life using this emergency road departure capability. Okay, we wanted to test that as well as the between and within car variability. So again, we're looking at this skill, how well the car does in this um, environment and what the variability might be. Same initial conditions, same 10 car, same three cars, 10 trials each. So the car started out. Now we didn't use autopilot on this one because um, we wanted to test Tesla's claim that it you could be really in any mode and it would do it. We just used automated um, advanced cruise control. And so 35 miles an hour, the car was accelerated, put into ACC. Then right at these where we had lines on the road, there was a three to five degree nudge to the right. And the student put the car, there was a cone here. The student angled the wheel, the steering wheel to head for this cone. So the idea is that it was a gradual shift off the road. And indeed what the car should have done is steered back on. And if the car didn't steer back on, then um, Ben, the driver would take over. But again, the assumption is driver is totally distracted. Driver's hands are not on wheel. You know, once, once, once three, five degree nudge happens. And we have all the video to show, you know, um, where uh, Ben's hands were the whole time. And, uh, so not only should the car steer itself back onto the road, there should be an audio alert that and visual alert that go along with it. This is part out of the Tesla manual. So we had to drop two of the trials. So instead of 30 trials, we only had 28 here because two of the nudges ended up in the car just never actually getting to the point where assistive action, just the cars steered itself back onto the road. So we didn't use those. Uh, two trials. So uh, we looked at the angle of wheel rotation first. We wanted to make sure that Ben actually got the three to five degrees on the remaining of the um, trials and there was no statistical uh, difference in the wheel angle inputs. So that's true. So you can see in the graph below. Um, so none means that no alarm or assist was given. The light gray is 
an alarm condition was given and then the dark gray is a cyst was given. So only 21% of these 28 trials had any active emergency steering. So it basically had an 80% failure rate that the cars did at actually steering back onto the road. Ben had to steer, get the car back on the road in 80% of trials. Uh, more concerning is the fact that only half the trials um, alerted the driver. So if this were real, half the drivers would have gone off the road and had no indication that they were headed that way, nor would they have had steering assist. So at best, Tesla is overclaiming what the car can do. Um, and at worst, it's letting people, it's giving people a false sense of security that the car is more capable than it is. So um, there wasn't statistical variability in the actual counts, but I think the overall presentation of 21% only had active steering assist and 50% had no uh, alerts is pretty significant. Uh, we couldn't test the driver monitoring system again because it was um, such a short period of time. The only driver monitoring was that the car was going off the road. The brightness test, just like the construction test, showed no significance. Again, I think it's because it was a single axis. Um, and for the most part, the sun was always from the driver's back. Okay, last test. And then we'll let you guys, I, I can see that there's questions piling up and, and we'll get to these in a little bit. So the last test is the highway driver monitoring. So there have been a couple of high profile Tesla deaths where um, Tesla drivers took their hands off the steering wheel and then hit trucks broadside. <clears throat> and there's been a lot of question about why cars, you know, should or should not be able to um, be driven that long without the hands on the wheel. So we actually just wanted to test that, like what is going on? So we're really looking squarely at when you break this, if somebody's on the highway, which is the best domain. In fact, it's the only operational domain that, that autopilot's supposed to be used in. So if it's being used in the domain in the way that it's intended, is the car actually alerting drivers at the right times per Tesla's manual that the car is, um, that the driver needs to get their hands back on the steering wheel? So we have this expressway, it's a toll road. You guys would hilarious, find this hilarious. Like with toll roads and everything cropping up all over the place in Maryland, we have this one toll road in um, North Carolina in the Raleigh-Durham area and no one uses it because we're too cheap to use toll roads and traffic isn't bad here. So um, it's kind of hilarious because it's this great road, cameras everywhere and we work with the Turnpike Authority um, so it turned out to be an awesome public proving ground. Um, there were occasional cars on it, but it's so lightly used that um, it turns out to be a great resource. So we had a 5.2 miles north, uh, south, and then we turn around and do the 5.2 back. So just back and forth, back and forth. So same cars, 10 tests each. Uh, <laughs> we, we stopped the test at 4 p.m. for what, what our version of rush hour, but our version of rush hour is what the Beltway in D.C. looks like at 2 a.m. So uh, at this now, the speed limit is 70 miles an hour. That's also one of the other reasons we wanted to use it, because it is a high um, speed limit uh, area. And so Ben accelerated the car to 70, popped on autopilot, and then took his hands off the wheel. And then he would get alert, okay? That same alert that I showed you before, which is right here, put your hands back on the wheel. So he put his hands on the wheel. And then as soon as it cleared, he took his hands off, hands on, hands off. So through one 5.2 mile section, he might get up to eight grabs, depending on what was happening. Uh, now, we wanted to test not only what that cycle was, it should have been around 25 to 30 seconds for between each alerting cycle. We also wanted to see how long it took to clear the alarm once you put your hands on the steering wheel, because it is a point of distraction. People, people hate this feature. They talk about it uh, as the autopilot nag. So they feel like the car is nagging and they, they, they have to put their hands back on the wheel because the autopilot is nagging them. Indeed, people have tried to sell products to 
um, make the autopilot nag go away, they've had to be taken down. Um, NHTSA finally did its job and told people they couldn't do it, but there's still tons of YouTube uh, videos out there that, that teach you how to use an orange. So you could put an orange in the steering wheel, you can kind of wedge it in, and that's just enough torque to make the car believe that you are hands-on, and it will never give you the hands, uh, get your hands back on the wheel sign. So that's probably not good either. All right, so we ended up with 162 events, 13 dropped because the data didn't record during the times um, for whatever reason. And uh, so this is what it looks like. So right away, you should see that car two had significantly fewer trials than cars one and three. And the trials would end up in one of three ways. You could either have a success, meaning that you would put your hands on the wheel and the alert would clear. And then you take your, and autopilot should still stay on. So autopilot was on, you know, despite the fact that you were going on and off because you had not reached the three strikes you're out, autopilot should stay on. So that was a success. A failure is uh, the car just shut off. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry that the car was, uh, the driver was not alerted and the car was unsafe. We'll talk about that in a second. Then the shut off occurred when you put your hands on the steering wheel and it cleared the alert and then you took your hands off but in a very small percentage of trials, 3.6, when you took your hands off, autopilot would shut off, but it wouldn't tell you. The light, there was a little light, the light would go away, but it wasn't obvious. And the light is tiny and it kind of sits behind the steering wheel. So it's easy to miss if you're not looking squarely at it. So, and that's unexpected because the, the driver's expectation is if I listen to the nag and I do what the nag tells me, autopilot's gonna stay on. And we'll talk a little bit more about why that's important. Car two, my student after this, my student was in love with Tesla's before um, we did all this testing. And then my student is gonna have to have some post-traumatic stress uh, insurance uh, after this because the car traumatized him. Um, he had to end, remember car two is the one with the full self-driving package. Uh, it would just run itself off the road. It would just kind of take over and do something different and wild and totally unexpected, like careen off the road and the student would have to get back on the steering wheel. And then during one of the runs, the student would, if that happened, the student aborted the rest of the trials. And then he would get off at the next exit. And then the way you reset the computer in the car is that you turn off the car, you get out, you have to shut the door, the keys have to be on the outside of the car, and then you get back in the car, you start it up again. So he would do this manual reset after the car would do something wild. And um, it, for whatever reason, um, the car just kept doing wild things all day. So overall, what we, oh, and let me, the graph below is, so it turns out that the cars are, giving alerts around the timeframes that they should. So there wasn't really statistical difference in terms of the, it should have been about 25 to 30 seconds. Um, it was a little higher than we ex expected about, uh, about 32 seconds on average, even when you adjust for, sometimes cars would cut in front of us in the middle of the test and the car would have to slow down for a second before um, the car would um, clear out of the way. But even if you account for um, the minor slowdowns, there still is a little bit more time than what the manual tells you. Um, that being said, each of the cars was very consistent in terms of alerting the driver when to put their hands back on the wheel. And there was no statistical difference in the time it took to actually clear the alert. So um, that was a good result for Tesla, I think. But what was a bad result for Tesla was that 3% of the 3.6% of the successful trials ended with this unexpected shutoff of autopilot. And this is a well-known problem uh, in aviation called mode confusion. People think they're still on autopilot. And indeed, there are a number of accidents, I mean, more than I can count, where people swear, swear, swear they were in autopilot and the car ran itself off the road. And, they're, and then, you know, autopilot, they try to sue Tesla. Tesla pulls the tapes and sure enough, autopilot was legitimately turned off. But the funny thing is, I believe these drivers. I, I believe that the drivers do 
did think their car was an autopilot because we have seen it multiple times in this in these tests that the car will shut autopilot off and there is no obvious alert to the driver other than some really small um, indication that autopilot is no longer functioning. Car two is clearly a problem, uh, just as it was in the construction test. And if you look in the Tesla forums, uh, you know, the, we're, we aren't the only person suffering this. There is some suggestion that it has something to do with the recharging, why that would be, I don't know. Uh, I don't know enough about how the electrical system of this car uh, works, but you know, it's um, car two is clearly a problem. Car two is clearly not full self-driving, even though it is the only technically full self-driving car that we tested. And last, last but not least, you know, even though Tesla says and their cars generally do perform um, between alerting events of hands-on alerting events of 30 seconds. You know, there were a couple of cars that went much longer, um, you know, almost 45 seconds. Uh, and you have to ask yourself, you know, you're, when you're moving that fast down the road, should a person ever be allowed to take their hands off the wheel for 45 seconds? I mean, I, I would say it's more like four and a half seconds is where the right number should be. Uh, so this, again, it's a question about regulation and technology performance. Is this right? Is this the way we should be thinking about it? Okay. Uh, all right. Oops. Let's go back to the meta-analysis of the whole thing. So indeed, um, the perception systems for cars one and three seem to be pretty consistent. Sometimes they were good and sometimes they were bad. And indeed, the picture on the right shows how each of the tests perform per car. I mean, it was kind of all over the place. The only tests that actually came out in the way that we thought that they would were cars one and three for the highway test. But the big question mark is there because, you know, I'm still not sure that's a good thing because people were given so much time that their hands could be off the wheel. Uh, for the most part, other than the construction test and the curve test where there's kind of some inconsistent alerting, the alerting was dangerous uh, and not at all in keeping with what we would think with A, what Tesla is advertising and B, what we would consider safe for a human autonomous collaborative system. I think, uh, you know, car two, it's just, you know, who knows? And this is one of the issues with over the air updates. We couldn't control over the air updates. Um, I think one of the cars, there was an over the air update in the middle of like, we had the car one day for the track test and then the next day for the highway test. And that night the car went through an over the air update. And by the way, remember none of the cars at any point in time, even cars one and three had the same software version, even when an update happened. So we're not able to control for that. And it's not clear that, you know, maybe Tesla is fixing little problems or are they fixing potentially big problems? Or did they actually do an over the air update for car two that led to some of these crazy problems and then maybe fixed it in a later over the air update? So this is the wild, wild west of over the air updates and software for safety critical systems. These are not cell phones, right? It's, you can get away with fixing cell phone problems using over the air updates like we all do. Uh, you know, I mean, at worst, your cell phone um, stops working, and that may be an emergency panic for you, but it's not the same as having a car that was working fine one day, all of a sudden not be working the next day. All right, so I've talked a lot. Uh, I would say overall, where did we see in, in the skills, rules, knowledge, expert base? I mean, it's a clear red. This driver alerting is not working. It's not bridging the gap between rule and knowledge. I mean, drivers are getting themselves into very, very bad situations here because they don't have the right human machine interface to make sure that the drivers are an active participant in the system. And while there's a little bit of green um, in the skill, I would say for the most part, when you look at all the tests in the aggregate, this is bad. The autonomy is very inconsistent. It's not the same for a single car, much less all cars, even for the cars that performed well. And so the question is, if we have this kind of system that has very inconsistent, possibly dangerous performance at the skill-based level, and we don't have effective alerting to keep the human in this loop, then 
shouldn't should these cars be allowed to operate in public domains or wherever we think that they could potentially cause safety problems and so that raises the questions of you know are people being used for beta testing and is that right and is should more be done on a regulatory front okay with all of that proselytizing um why don't we go to questions and now i can actually look at the q a Missy, thank you very much for that fascinating talk. Uh, so I'll, I'll get started reading some of the questions from the uh, the Q and A. And folks, if you're interested in asking a question, please feel free to enter it in the Q and A or to upvote some of the ones that are already there. So I'll just start with a question of my own. Do you think there are a set of, of tests that should be run on any car that wants to claim to be a um, hands-free autonomous vehicle? in a level five setting? Yes. Um, so I do think that we, especially in these early days of the wild, wild west, I, I have written extensively about this. I think we need sets of vision tests, both static vision test and dynamic vision tests that um, tell us whether or not a car is going to perform in the way that it is advertised and in the operational domains that it's supposed to perform in. And of course, everybody who's on this call, at least from APL is gonna understand, nobody wants to pay for testing. Everybody hates paying for testing. It does add cost, but the bottom line is it has to be done. And we're talking about a world where people in these environments, the Silicon Valley ethos is, oh, break it and then we'll fix it. And it's, you know, agile software uh, engineering. And you're like, whoa, 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 you know, traditional systems engineering has something important to say about this. So I do think that uh, it is important. And this is one of the reasons I go on these um, talks is we need to make sure Silicon Valley understands that the fake, the uh, fix it, break it, fix it, break it fast. Mm, you know, we, we need to rethink that. And so I'm, I'm all for blending the Silicon Valley, you know, ethos with more of a traditional systems engineering ethos. And I think APL and, and IAA um, can actually have a really strong footprint in that space, given the fact that you bring some of that traditional expertise. We've just got to figure out how to fuse it with Silicon Valley. And that's easier said than done. Thank you. So the first question is uh, regarding automated cars. They do well with white lines, uh, but since they're tested in Arizona and California and Texas, how do those cars do in snow, do you think? Well, this has been a big point of debate. You know, it's great that you can have um, cars in Arizona work. And, you know, that's where Waymo has its quote unquote driverless car program. But uh, it, it is clear that snow is a, is a completely different scenario. And um, you know they do have some testing going on in Michigan, but the funny thing is you don't have any driverless car services in Michigan, right? And we have seen, there have been um, reports that a stop sign with a half an inch of snow on it looks very different from a stop sign with uh, an inch of snow on it. And so I think we are very, very far from understanding environmental impacts of, and it's not even just snow. In Arizona, they have dust storms and dust on these sensors can cause significant problems. And so even in areas where you think the weather is more favorable, uh, I, there are still areas where they have problems. Perception's a big issue, that's for sure. <laughs> Another question, uh, just to confirm, there's no audible alarm to alert the driver in these cars? So there's a ding that goes off in that sequence of three alarms I'll show you. There's a little bing, bing, bing. It doesn't always happen. Um, the, in the highway test, when autopilot would turn off, it would not happen then. In the curve test, when it was going through, it happened for all three of those. So that is also inconsistent. And, um, but the, and also the ding is very quiet. And if you are listening to the radio or you're talking to someone in the car, you're not gonna hear that ding, but the ding also does not always go off. Right, so you maybe want it to instead being a little nag to being more and more forceful at some point. 
Yes, well, you guys have the submarine research going in there. We need that wah, wah submarine um, uh, arm in the car for when that happens. The next question is, with that many repetitions on I-540, did the cars exhibit any learning about oh, the wind? No. Oh, no, 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 no. The cars don't do any real-time learning. So um, one of my former, actually two of my former students from MIT, um, superstars, they were both in the autonomy division at Tesla and they both have left. Um, but I've been there personally and they don't, they, none of the learning happens in real time. The learning happens all in uh, post hoc training of the data sets and you know how often, and you know, that's what drives some of the over the air updates, but how often data sets get updated. I mean, that these are trade secrets that companies are sitting on. It's certainly not daily. I would, I would, you know, depending on what, what the environment is, it may not even be yearly. And, and I think that's one we need to think about we need more transparency in the over the air update process to find out well you know are you fixing safety critical elements are you introducing new possible unsafe regimes and should there be some kind of periodic and agreed upon by industry I, i'm a big fan of industry self-regulation as opposed to the government coming down with a big hammer but you know, industry needs to come together on this. Uh, right now it is the wild, wild west and without anybody asserting any kind of best practices, mm -hmm. it's difficult to say whether or not somebody's doing it right or wrong um, and also because nobody's sharing their data. Yeah, big issues there on learning and testing and in what order you do them. Did you uh, ever run any of the trials with other vehicles on the road? Wait, no, so did they ever do any of the trials. So it says any of the trials of the test, I'm assuming that was the I-540. Did they ever? Run any of the trials with other vehicles. Oh, other, oh, no, no, no. I thought you meant run into other vehicles. No, no, no. So we, um, we, want, we were gonna bring the Cadillacs potentially into the 540 test, but then COVID, it became imminent that COVID was coming. So we just you know cut our losses and just finished it with the Teslas. So we are actually in the stage right now of planning the second set of tests. And we are, we're gonna bring in uh, maybe a Beamer and a Cadillac and do some other testing uh, more based on highway testing. And indeed, um, you know, if we're looking for areas of collaboration, uh, the track testing and even highway testing, these are manpower intensive events. If you, anybody from APO would like to come down and just be part of it, um, and be with us and see how we do it and just participate to get experience and what it's like to test these vehicles. Happy to have you on board. Thank you. That's something we're gonna look at, I'm sure. Uh, we'll skip to this next one is, um, I wonder what if any research has been conducted about driver distractedness in an L2 plus car versus other cars. So when drivers feel like the car is in control, do they generally allow themselves to become too distracted to take over if necessary? Yeah, I mean, there's been both a lot of academic and industry-based research and the consent, and this is from AAA, IHS, um, Consumer Reports. Yes, people are mentally checking out. We knew they would be, you know, the, the aviation research was, you know, it, it was clear from the significant body of research there that this was gonna happen. And indeed it has happened and it has led to um, at least been a significant contributor to many crashes. So it's no surprise. And indeed this is why people are jumping up and down and saying that Tesla should no longer be able to use, nor any car actually, torque monitoring for their driver assist system, that it should be camera-based. And I'm, I'm in full agreement. Using a camera-based system is, you can still work around it and cheat the system. It's harder to do, uh, but there's no question that torque monitoring is just, not, it's just, it's just not doing anything for you. So we need to just get rid of that system as a driver monitoring system. This is great, Missy, thank you. We're about out of time. I wonder if any of the panelists have a, a final question they'd like to present. Ms. Canyon, Missy, thanks. This is such a fascinating talk and really important. You know, one of the things that it's really obvious is appropriate calibration of trust in autonomous systems is critical. 
right? So how can we create a better intuitive communication between machine and person? So you know, this, this you talk about this mode confusion, right? So is it all about user design, or are there functionally things with the autonomy that we sh should be doing to kind of create a better shared mental model between human and machine? Yeah. So the answer is yes and yes. I mean, I think there's some user interface designs. Just you know, a simple one is the volume of this alert, right? I mean, the alert should be much more obvious when you're in an operational domain and the system is seeing something that it either doesn't understand or it's not sure what it's seeing, right? So I, I do think that there needs to be a more, uh, a better approach to making the system more collaborative with humans, but that also might mean turning off some features that drivers think that they do want. I mean, so I think the fundamental question is, should drivers be able to put cars on auto nav so that the car can steer itself around cars in front of it? I mean, I want ACC. I'm, I pull a trailer. I've got an RV. I want to be able to, to have cruise control. So you better not touch my cruise control. But, you know, there is a point at which when the car is doing so much by itself that you simply cannot let that happen um, because the drivers are just going to check out, right? So there's this balance between then that that's a marketplace. Like, well, if we take that away, then is somehow is that going to make us less competitive? And I say no, because I think there's a huge space for, um, Toyota has a program called The Guardian, where they layer in technology to help humans instead of replace humans. And, and that space I still think is virtually untouched. So I think we need to spend more time thinking about these guardian technology, how to keep the human in at the right time, at the right place, um, until self-driving cars can really come on board and really do it all. But until, until they can really do it all, we can't be in this quasi in-between space. So we need to have humans and machines working together and then be able to jump to doing it all. We should, that in-between space is very, very dangerous. Thank you, Missy. Thank you. Um, I think we're about out of time here. I want to thank you so much for a fascinating talk on, on a topic that's uh, both both timely and important to uh, the Institute for Assured Autonomy. We look forward to visiting your racetrack and uh, working with you in the future. It sounds like a, a lot of stuff we could be doing together. Sounds great. Looking forward to it. Good. Thank you. Everybody have a wonderful day. Thanks for having me.